Welcome to The Rake. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Uh, we have Norman Chad, one of the voices of poker, along with Lon McCarran. Um, he also just recently adopted my puppy's sister. So Norm and I are uh, in-laws, technically. Um, welcome, Norm. How are you, how's it going? Uh, it's going good. Could, you, you said very special guest. Can you give me the list of guests you've had or just special guests? <laughs> We had Jeff Platt. We just said we have a guest. That's there. Shall we <laughs> say no more? You've uh, you, you've met that requirement. Um, so how how have you been? How's it been having the summer just off? Is it weird? Uh, it's weird, but as far as being at home a lot, I'm usually doing that anyway. And uh, my wife has gone a lot. And the weird thing of this particular summer off is uh, my wife Tony went back, back east just before the whole. Uh, no travel thing began. I have not seen her for five months, which effectively, I believe, extends our marriage by five years. But uh, that's been odd just to be here by myself. And uh, But not being in Las Vegas for the, the Rio, it feels odd. But, you know, at least uh, I'm not in the men's main men's bathroom three times a day being told bad beat stories as I uh, make my way to the sink. Yeah. So, puppies. <laughs> <laughs> we were gonna end with puppies and then Marley Marley's been thinking about dogs too. But we gotta end with puppies because I want to talk about all these people we're gonna trash first. Um <laughs> just kidding. But uh, let's give a background first. Um how exactly did it come about that you and Lon became the faces and voices of the ESPN main event? Uh complete accident and different roads for both of us. Lon uh, when a new production com- a production company came in, ESPN decided in 03 that they were going to do extended coverage of the main event for the first time. They hired a production company from outside uh, who actually had no poker experience. And when they were putting together what they're going to do, they noticed that Lon had done the previous year's main event with Gabe Kaplan. And they decided ah, that that voice will work for us. We can use him. Uh, in the meantime, the people who hired me at ESPN thought I had more poker experience than I had. They asked me to consult with the production company to help them put together the telecasts in planning what they were going to do. Uh, I had never played No Limit Hold'em in my life. I've never played tournaments in my life. Uh, I did play poker, but they just were mistaken. They just thought I had a gambling problem. So I did consult with them for several months in O2. And then after several months of conference calls and emails and stuff the producer called me up and said uh would you be interested in being the uh being the tv commentator on poker and i remember i thought it was almost like a joke question i remember i told hey hey sure matt you know it's every boy's dream from the time they're five years old to be the tv commentator on poker i mean what the hell are you talking about (laughs) poker doesn't even exist on tv and they said well you know, we, we're, we're not going to use a poker player. We're not going to use like a helm youth or something for several reasons. And you make us laugh and you entertain us during the conference calls and the email. So we thought you might be interested. And I said, let me get back to you at the end of the week. Uh, I didn't think it was a big deal. I talked to my best friend. I didn't even know I was going to do it. I talked to my best friend uh, back east and he said, why are you not going to do it? I said, I don't know. It's, you know, it's poker on TV and why would I do it? He said, well, here's one good reason. You have no career right now. I said, okay. <laughs> you, you, make, you make a strong argument. Uh, so I decided to do it and, uh, that's how me and Lon got together. It's kind of odd. Uh, you know, were you kind of known before that as being like the funny man or was that a new role? Not, not really much. Again, I had very little television experience. I have written for my entire life. I've written a sports humor column, uh, mostly for the Washington post. So I've always taken a humorous approach to sports. I never did it seriously. I wouldn't have been writing columns if I had to go to games and interview half naked or fully naked athletes as they're walking out of the shower to ask them, what were you thinking when you threw that bad pitch that gave up the game winning home run? I never would have done that. So yeah, I'd always written sports humor columns and I had done some ESPN TV work for their uh, sports writer panel shows and stuff like that, where again, I'm going to take a light approach to it. But yeah, I was not known as a funny, you know, this, this production company didn't know me from, from, you know, from whatever that expression is from Oz. So yeah, I just was funny with them. Uh, on the phone calls, and that led to the Chris Moneymaker year, which leads to this very unfortunate moment where both of you have to speak to me. <laughs> um, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Do you know, we asked only about, how many people did you ask, Marley? I asked about 14 people for this week. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Everyone was like, oh, man. Do we yeah, have- they're really 
tired from the series and stuff, or they were traveling out of the country to go play GG. Um, anyway, we're happy to have you, Norm. And uh, I was going through your tweets. Um, I'm still scarred from that. But uh, you said this is the worst WSOP of the century. Uh, too many ranchries, not enough mixed games, and nobody in the world can play all the events because you either in the U.S. or out. So you're like, ha- I mean, there's a few people who are traveling to play both. But did this change when you got your uh, run in the 1K08 event? Is it now the best WSOP? No. So, I mean, I'm glad I had the run. Uh, it, you know, uh, I had not cashed for several years at the WSOP. I play about an average of four events a year. But no, I, uh, I understand the, the WSFP, which I have a great amount of respect for. Obviously, I actually work with them in, in, you know, hand in hand. Uh, they were dealt a bad hand this year, and I just think they played it poorly. Uh, what, what we have here is a situation which every which way you look, there's a problem. So this year became the World Series of Hold'em. That's, there's no way around it. More than 90% of the events are Hold'em. There's been a sea change the last few years with reentry. Uh, and it, it hit the worst last year during the World Series Europe, where every event was multiple reentry. If not, some of them are unlimited reentry, and that's just wrong for the World Series for you know for World Series of Proof of Bracelets, in my view. So this year, not only were ninety percent of the World Series events hold them, but ninety percent of them are multiple reentry, which I hate. Uh, you know, we've invented a new word called freeze out that didn't exist ten years ago. I hate when new words come. I remember when I was just a big sports fan growing up. Uh, they played on grass in football and on baseball. They played on grass. Then they brought in artificial turf, which is fine, uh, but they invented a new term called natural grass. Oh, you're on natural grass now. You're not on artificial grass. Well, natural grass is grass, okay? <laughs> a freeze out is what we used to call any poker event, which is you play until you, all your chips are gone. That's, that's the mm-hmm. event. You, get, you pay an entry fee. You get chips. When you have no chips, you are eliminated. That was poker until – Reentries and rebuys were invented. So now a regular poker event, as we used to know it, is a freeze out. Ooh, it's going to be a freeze out, and everything else is standard. Who's getting fired up? She He's came in from outside. She heard me yelling. But mm-hmm. talking about being dull about me, I, I had a quiet home until <laughs> Jamie. No, not now. <laughs> I had a quiet home. Nobody lived with me. Even my <laughs> wife didn't let me. Do. Come on. Just quit it. Uh, Daddy. That's great. Anyway, so yeah, so now everything is re-entry. So we have a combination of 90% re-entries and 90% of hold'em. It shouldn't be the World Series of Poker. And on top of that, you have this odd situation you mentioned where the first 30 events, you had to be in Nevada or New Jersey. You know, personally, I would have picked uh, Montana and the Virgin Islands if it's going to be U.S. states and territories. And then for the last 54 events, you cannot be in the United States of America which is pretty odd since it's by obviously the, one of the most populous countries in the world and the most populated part of the World Series of Poker because it's in Las Vegas. So it's it's just kind of screwed all the way around. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of your points. I think the freeze-out thing, the, there have to be more freeze-outs. I understand when you're traveling to events, if you're going to play a 5K and the overhead to get to this place is super high, the hotels are so much money and whatever, you don't want to play once, be out, and then like go home. So like I understand one reentry or when the series has like multiple good side events that have a couple of reentries, but with online poker, I'm like, I don't know. They could just offer more tournaments. It's not like you bust the one WSOP bracelet event and go, well, my night's over. Like there's other stuff to play. So I don't know. There are at least a few freeze outs on the, on the schedule, but I agree with you that, uh, I mean, it's good for players to have more. There's going to be actual recreational players who make the final table. The fewer reentries there are allowed. Yeah. By the way, and just think of how, you know, there's a, there's a big mixed game community, and they mm-hmm. just this is just completely shut out of this World Series. So that's a whole year that goes by where everybody else can accumulate one of 85 bracelets and play their favorite event of the year. The mixed game community says, "Oh no, we you know we can't do it," and that to me is also was embarrassing to the World Series of Poker that they didn't have the software to accommodate anything but flop games. But that's not possible. I, I play in a 21 game mix online run by some guy named Biff out of the trunk of his car with the greatest software I've ever seen in the World (laughs) Series of Poker, the number one brand in the world, can't offer stud eight? (laughs) I don't get it. I don't know if they're just not willing to spend the money to acquire software that good, but 
you'd think after like the rake was super high on this one, like, su- like it was live level rake 450 plus 50 for an online event is almost unheard of. So you'd think that collecting that rake, eventually they'd be able to purchase some better software, maybe in the future. And by the way, I, I, I have a million reasons to dislike poker stars, but I'll say this, that online poker, uh, and that this was happening before Black Friday, it actually helped revive mixed games that were dying in live casinos. And I give credit to, you could, play, you could learn them online at, at very cheap, and I give credit to some younger players who might not have played otherwise who helped revive mixed games and decide, let me, let me try another game, or maybe I can master this game, and then be, you know, everyone's got no limit to hold them mastered or solved. So they, 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 they just went into PLO and Omaha 8 and Deuce to 7 and, and Stud 8. And so these young guys have actually helped revive the mixed games. These young guys now are approaching 40, which makes me very happy because they're always so happy. Oh, look, I'm 26 years old. I'm a young guy and all that. Yeah, good <laughs> luck, Mr. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have your hemorrhoids and kidney stones and IBS, and I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> so that kind of kills the kid with dream thing. So now it's just like middle-aged dude with a dream? Pretty much. <laughs> there's always another, you know, there's always, people are always having uh, relations and there'll always be new kids coming along that are 21. And so, you know. <laughs> So, um, oh, thir- sorry, Marley. Did you get 13th in this uh, 08? Uh, yeah, that was really fun. Uh, like I said, I had not uh, cashed since 2014. I played three or four events a year. Uh, I only played two events this summer, and I cashed in both of them. And 13th is great. It's, uh, you know, I, I've, it's, it's, it's actually, of, of the six caches I've had, I've been fortunate in my World Series career, uh, or six or seven caches, that four or five of them were the final two tables. And it's just, you know, I don't like tournaments, but it's fun. I'm not an online person. I had not played, an, a, I had not played a hand of online poker before the uh, COVID came. So mm-hmm. it was an odd experience playing online. Uh, I was greatly helped by the online group that I play with every week now. Uh, they were on Zoom for, after I was on for a couple hours, they were on Zoom like a live rail, just watching uh, me for, 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 for the last six hours. That was such a great feeling instead of sitting in a hotel room alone. Uh, at State Line Nevada, which is another experience. Uh, so that just felt so great to go deep with them. Uh, and yeah, it's just, it, it was, it was a wonderful feeling. And I actually was, you know, I was very fortunate to get that, get that far. I played very well for me most of the time and I played very poorly down the stretch and I deserved to be knocked out uh, in 13. It's funny that Prim has become this like place for gamblers. I would never have even noticed it driving wherever. Um, but Tony Dunst had pointed it out. We had been writing a thing together and he's like, oh, okay, I got to go. Cause I got to go to Prim real quick. I've just sit in the parking lot, make some bets and I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? Like our country is so crazy that you just sit in a gas station parking lot, put in fantasy football, whatever, or like sports bets or whatever it is. I don't even know what he's doing. I guess it was fantasy football. Um, and then drive all the way back. <laughs> How does this make sense? You know, Prim State Line and Prim is the Prim Valley Resort is the, the casino there. I live in Los Angeles. I have driven to and from La, from uh, Las Vegas, you know, between 100 and 200 times in the last quarter century. I, I drive more than I, I fly. I have never stopped at the what used to be multiple casinos there, and there's a couple more a little further in Gene. I used to love the sign when we were driving back, which is the the big the big uh, sign, which always tells you know prime rib three ninety nine that type of thing, loses slots <laughs> at the state line. But my favorite sign is last chance to get even. So people <laughs> stop in and they go, oh, yeah, let's go in there and uh, see if we can get this three thousand dollars back in fifteen minutes. Yeah. So I've never stopped in Prim in my entire life. So the idea of booking a hotel at state line. And going into that antiseptic hotel room and just sitting there, particularly during COVID, where you're not going to go through that, you know, first of all, masks are required for everybody, according to the sign there. They take your temperature when you come in. And when you look at the, the gaming area, which no longer has live gaming, it's all slots and video poker, half the people are not wearing masks. The, the mm-hmm. sign says they're masks required 24-7. And you look at this, and half of them, the half that aren't wearing masks are only half of the people that are smoking. Everybody's smoking. <laughs> You know, they'll take the mask out. If you have the mask on, put the mask on. But it's, it's just so, all right, I'm going to my room right now, okay? I'm not even going to sleep in the bed. I'm going to sleep standing up like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Murphy <laughs> bed. I'm a Murphy bed that we're not taking out. I'm just sleep standing up. It, it was such a weird experience, but it was fun. And since I was two for two there, if we have online poker in the future as part of the, the, the live world series, which they always have a few events, mm-hmm. I got a feeling the balance is going to change. Uh, I am just, I'm not going to be in the Rio. I am, I am going to be in Prim, 
playing in, in room 2254. <laughs> and I'm not coming to Las Vegas for those online events. Nice. So, do you think that any chance next year is canceled as well? Or any, you know, anything is possible. Uh, yeah. You know, they're still hoping to have a version of the live event, something this fall, and that's very, very unlikely. But we don't know where COVID's headed. You know, as I said since the beginning on COVID, because I didn't know that, I, I, I guess like some of the rest of us, I didn't know this was going to become a big politically divisive thing, like whether to wear masks or not. We've had a bunch of difficult decisions to make from day one. None of them are easy solutions. So whether we should have shut down completely or not shut down, I don't know. We just, you know, we follow the science, we follow the, the scientists' advice, and even that's become politically charged. Uh, there's a chance there won't be. You know, there's a chance that but what we saw this year is a version of what the World Series of Poker will be like forever or down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might be all online uh, by the time I'm dead. Now, I could be dead within 15 days, but it could be all online sooner or later. Yeah, that's a bummer, though, because I think a lot of the allure of WSOP is the whole grown-up summer camp thing. As much as I'm jaded and I've been in poker for way too long, um, I like that. I, I get really excited end of May to go see my friends. And then also, like, making a run in a live event. Uh, I made a run in the last 1K, the, like, the main online. Um, and I was thinking, I'm like, I got 37th or something. I was like, if this was in a live event, I'd be so excited. I probably, like couldn't even eat or or whatever like but online is like okay it's online poker and i'm just playing and i've played thousands and thousands of tournaments and it didn't feel like that like it helped that jeff platt was streaming it because then it adds a little bit of, of excitement to it but i really hope that that's not true i i know that they're going to have more online events especially if they can get away with raking that high without the overhead of dealers and whatever else for people um but i would be really sad if we didn't all get together and drink too much all summer and stuff like that so the other problem with online is, and, and I, I was very disturbed. This is going to be my, my when, when I've played online before the World Series, uh, I like using the chat box. And mm -hmm. then I would not be playing in the home game I'm playing in unless it was also Zoomed. So mm -hmm. it felt like a live game where we could see everybody else and you could bullshit with people. And also, I also did, you know, I also used the chat box. So the fact that this year they decided to disable the World Series chat box, which I did not know going into it. Uh, was really disappointing because, as you said, live is a better feeling. You you have a rail, you have your friends all excited. To you know, we're all, you know, it's it's part of the world that's getting worse. You know, we're all moving inward in, in a million ways, even before COVID. You know, with food delivery and, and and just watching TV all day and what we've been doing for the past couple generations. There's there's no human contact. So to, to lose the last human interaction online, where you can't even go into the chat box is really a bad blow. It's, and I understand they got rid of the chat box because again, we're so screwed up, the chat box is too nasty and too toxic. Mm -hmm. uh, my solution is to take the damn thing back. You know, let's, it's, it's almost like the resistance. It's, you know, we, when I've played in live poker, when we have a cancer at the table, we embarrass them and we shame them and we, you know, we make them feel bad for being, for being hateful to the other players and being hateful to the dealer and throwing cards and doing all that. And we run them out. Now it's harder to run them out of the chat box but if enough of us are changing what the chat box is, you got to take it back. It's, I mean, yeah. what's the, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's soulless to sit there clicking fold, raise, check for hours mm -hmm. on end without having any contact uh, other than with mani maniacal rescue, rescue puppy mixes that are running around <laughs> destroying all your, they do eat your homework. So yeah. we need the chat box back. Yeah, it, it ended up wasting like several hours of my time that there was no chat box because then when I was mad at a player at the table, I had to find out who they were. I usually just call Mike the mouth and be like, yo, do you know this player, uh, Wolverine, whatever? And he'd be like, yeah, actually, this person, this is their, uh, here, let me dox them for you real quick. Then I have to go and write them an email, tell them to die in a grease fire. It is so much more work than when I just type it in the chat box. Uh, I've actually never seen a positive message in the chat box, I don't think. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> among regs. I feel like among, among regs, there's like trolling and stuff. It's funny. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I think it's just, I, I miss it. I didn't realize how much I did chat. I was always like, oh, I don't use a chat box. I'm on too many tables. And then when it was gone, I was like, oh yeah, I do say stuff. <laughs> yeah. We have the emojis now. I can throw shit at people and throw, you know, random shit. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a question for you. I don't know if Marley knows about this, but your like sports writing career, um, so I think you're a really good writer and I would never give you a compliment you didn't deserve. I probably don't even give you, I'm surprised I'm giving you this compliment, but you're a very good writer. I enjoy your column. Um, and I want to know how this Clay Travis beef started and 
what is the worst take he's ever had? Like what set you off where you're like, I'm going to tweet at this guy like 12 times a week. Screw this guy. Yeah. I wish, I wish I wasn't doing that actually. Uh, because right now <laughs> I'm trying to one, I'm trying to make Twitter more positive. Uh, I don't want to be on Twitter. Uh, I never would have gone on Twitter originally eight or 10 years ago, but somebody was tweeting under my name and agreed to give me my account. It was, it was, a, it was a fan of mine in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, it might've been Remco. Uh, no, it wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't have been a fan of mine. It was a fan of mine in the Netherlands who was a big, you know, big supporter. And, uh, he would just quote me from the broadcast and his English was a second language. So he'd actually quote me inaccurately. And sometimes he'd have typos and I go, my goodness, you know, I'm not this stupid. No. That makes uh, way more sense that your biggest fan doesn't really speak English. Okay, good for you. Uh, very, very good. If if you could want to take a break right now and Marley can continue with the rest of the interview, none of us here would have any problem. Anyway, so I got a Twitter account. I had I took it over from him. I had to send him two autograph pictures. And then, by the way, after he agreed, he, he scammed me. Uh, it was Norman Chad was a Twitter account. And after he gave it over to me, he then started Norman Chad quotes, <laughs> where he just did the same thing, just under a different Twitter account. Oh. Uh, and the same type of and all that. But anyway, uh, Clay Travis, I, again, I had never seen a, I, had, I was barely aware of Clay Travis before COVID. Uh, I knew he was a sports oh, yeah. writer. Who is he? What's that? Who is he? Okay. I'll tell, he, was, he, was, he's a, he used to be a, he was a lawyer. He was a sports writer. He has oh. a sports talk radio show. Uh, and then he has, uh, now he's on Fox sports one every day with a gambling show with three other people where they make bets. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> He started in, I, I was made aware of him on Twitter that like the very first week or two that we were having a problem and even before the shutdown, all that, he was from that school of this is no worse than the flu. This is ridiculous. Go on out there, have party like it's 1999. And I tweeted once about him. Uh, I just tweeted that one of his thing. I said, why are you doing this, Clay? You're putting people's lives in danger. You don't know the science. Why are you telling your, your hundreds of thousands of listeners to ignore this? And that was the end of that. Uh, and then I wrote a column when COVID was beginning uh, about, uh, it was a humor, again, it was a humor column. And one of the lines in where that was that was more serious line, which is, you know, come to think of it, you know, we're probably, we might be better off with sports not coming back. You know, less sports might be better for us for many, many reasons. He took a screenshot of the headline, which was a bad headline. It just said less sports are better. He put it out on the Twitter. I was crushed. For, which I've been crushed before by Barstool Sports and whatever, but I was crushed by all his people who said, this is, you know, everything they say about you, you know, when they just, they just call you names and you just, you just, you just mute them. But he, you know, so then I responded to him. Or I wrote a column about him the next week about what happened. And then I had a Twitter, a brief Twitter exchange with him. The only exchange we've really had where we went back and forth three or four times where again, he, he has his, his game plan is actually much like the president right now. Say whatever you say. You're never wrong. If somebody says that you said something, you say you never said it. If they present it that you said it, in, in, you know, word for word, they ignore that and just call you. In my, my case, he calls me grandpa or boomer. Or, it's, it's the same thing. You just deny whatever's going on and you move on. And that was the end of my exchange with him. And then since then, people send me his tweets because I don't follow the guy. Uh, and his tweets every day, he does a thing where he's, he's a, he's a COVID denier. He calls people who think that it's a serious thing. Corona bros. He calls it fear porn by the media that they're, they're reporting what they're reporting. Cause in reality, this again is nothing bad. He keeps moving the goalposts originally said, Oh, look, there's two deaths nationwide. Oh, big deal. Uh, you know, uh, the media doesn't cover car crashes, uh, but they cover COVID more people die in car crashes. Okay, first of all, they do cover car crashes. And second of all, car, 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 last time I looked, car crashes are not contagious. Uh, so, I mean, so he's just, so I just try to stop this. And so this has been a serious thing and he does not respond to me anymore. But they send me stuff and I try to get through a day or two or three because it's very negative energy, not where I see his stuff. But when I see his stuff and I see what he's saying, I just send out, you know, his name's Clay Travis. I now call him Clay Travesty. Uh, and he's just, he's the most dangerous guy in sports media. I have ever seen if you want to call him parts of sports media. So that's how that started. And I didn't even know who he was five months ago. Yeah. I, I took a little stroll through his timeline. I don't like him. <laughs> I went from not knowing about him to not liking him in the met in like the course of 20 minutes of scrolling. Um, it's just weird. The people who are COVID deniers are so absolutely sure it's not a thing. 
in the same way that people who don't know science at all are sure it is a thing. I was like, there's never any good evidence for why they think it's not real. They're not showing, hey, look, this hospital is totally empty and like no one's actually dying. And this person was reported as dead. They don't even exist. It wasn't real. There's no evidence. There's just like contrarianism where it's like, oh, the whole country's scared. I'm not scared. I'm a big manly man. I don't wear a mask. I'm not afraid of this virus. I'm like, cool. Like, it's not interesting. I was going to say, it's, it's crazy. Our last episode, we talked about Corona for like maybe five or 10 minutes. And la- the rest of the episode, we talked about some pretty, you know, you know, I don't want to say controversial, but some pretty lively convo. And all the comments in our YouTube, cha- YouTube channel are about, cor- about either like, you think Corona is real, like masks aren't real, or, or like, of course it's real. Like, it's just, everything's about Corona. In it, and it's like a poker podcast. We talked about it for even in this. I'm sure this one too. Like most of the comments are most of the beginning. Like, it's what they're gonna care about. It's so crazy how they, they took this issue that shouldn't be that divisive, and and we've turned it into this. It's so crazy. People get so angry about it. It's it's definitely a very charged issue. And to give you context, Norm, our last pod we talked about the Negronu outburst for yeah. like a decent part of it, and then we talked to Ebony Kenny about um, sexism in poker, and she had a lot of stuff to say about women, uh, whether there's sex work for stakes and all this different stuff. So we talked about all these things that you think people would be like up in arms in the comments, but they're just like wear a mask, don't wear a mask, like angry it's so insane you know i watched the last i just actually i tuned into the last one just to watch i want to see what ebony had to see say about negranu and mm-hmm. you, were, you were then pivoting into uh sexism and se- sexism hasn't been a problem in america since we gave you all the vote so i just turned it <laughs> off at that point I, I just wanted i was in a rush i just i did want to hear what you had to say about negranu yeah. listen to that portion and then you did switch the topics you're going to switch to something else you're and gonna was, have a fight with the women's groups again. Do you remember that last year on Facebook? He, yeah, I know. Norm said very innocently, like we're in a fight where I've probably said way worse stuff to you on ESPN. And he just goes, This is why they say women are the rake. And then the women's group on Facebook was just like, <laughs> get this misogynistic guy out of the building. Really? He's disrespecting her. He he's cutting her down, and all this stuff. And I was like, Did you not hear what I've said to this guy? <laughs> it was so much worse. Like, That's the way it works. I understand, uh, but I was glad that you you dealt with the Negrano thing, and I was glad that Emily Ebony uh, actually I contacted her afterwards uh, through DM about a couple of things uh, that she said. So I was glad to hear you all had that discussion. Yeah, she's uh, great. Yeah, I saw your tweets about it. About well, because you're pretty fair with, um, like you you covered it when Matisau made comments, and then when Negrano made comments, and it's like you just want <clears throat> excuse me poker to be I guess a little bit classier. And not so, I don't know. Like, yeah, it, I don't think it's that hard. And I've had, I've had really bad arguments with people I work with now in Poker Go with people like Jeff Platt, uh, who are just, they're not moving an inch on Daniel. And I just, I do not understand. It doesn't seem to be that difficult of an area for me, uh, how we present ourselves. And in, in Daniel's case, with those two outbursts and just other stuff he's done during his live stream, you know, he has a coterie of, apologists and protectors and acolytes and enablers around him in which if you know if, if he says the sun rises in the west then it rises in the west i don't get it that behavior you know i understand the basic instinct the basic sponta- spontane- spontaneous reaction to if somebody attacks a member of your family in some bad way particularly your spouse that you're gonna have a bad reaction but there's so many ways to handle that and one of them is not the way he handled it the language itself the threat of violence, uh, it's just, it's, it's, it's absurd. And then, of course, he doesn't even apologize for it. In fact, he does a announcement where he does the opposite of an apology. It's an F you to everybody who disagrees with him. And they all get behind him again. It's really bad for the game. Uh, I think it should be bad for civilization. It should be, in, in, another, in another era, it would have been bad for his brand. He would have lost sponsorships. He would have lost endorsements. He would have lost his ambassadorship. But now it's, you know, you go, boy. You go, boy. It makes no sense. Yeah. My main issue with um, the way that he portrays poker players is he will always say there's a dichotomy of you're either a robot with no personality, um, an unsponsorable robot, because all you do is just click buttons and win, and no one wants to watch you. You're so boring. Or you're a hothead, like cursing, raving lunatic. And that's what we want on TV. We want these crazy... I'm like... There are so many people in between. I know so many people in between that'd be fantastic ambassadors who are colorful, like 
energetic people who are really smart, who give great interviews, who don't curse at people and don't alienate people and apologize when they misspeak. It's there's not two sides of it. There's a whole spectrum of people. And I feel like whenever he's talking about it, he creates this false dichotomy so that he can say, well, I'm better than the robots. And I'm like, okay, but the people in the middle are better than you. They'd be a better ambassador than you. Um, and that's how I feel. But I also understand the people being apologists for him. He has hurt my career. Like I want to commentate. I enjoy commentating. He had me removed from a commentary that I was already signed up for. Um, because I speak my mind about him and uh, I'm not gonna kiss his ass. And recently I've just been studying a lot. So I'm like, well, that's one thing nobody can touch. If you're good at poker, you can make money in poker. You might not get these jobs you want, but they can't make you sit out a tournament because you didn't kiss the right ass. Ah, that felt good. I, I agree with you completely <laughs> on the, that there's, there's a middle ground. It's a huge middle ground that uh, can be occupied, but he has set it up as that dichotomy, I agree with you. And uh, you are also right. It's it's frustrating. You obviously you should, you should not be stopped from getting a job because one person uh, with a god complex just pushes a button because that, that ain't gonna happen. So you are. I, I think you have a low ceiling in poker, but I think it's good for you to study poker as much as you can to get as good as you can, which is not going to be very very good. But uh, it does remain <laughs> a meritocracy. So you're right. There's no nobody can you know anybody can sit down and nobody can stop you, and that is the way you should go. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> we interrupt this podcast with an important message from our sponsors at Run It Once. This week on Run It Once Poker, we're giving away over 12,500 euro in our popular leaderboard program. We're featuring three daily No Limit Hold'em leaderboards and three daily Pot Limit Omaha leaderboards that will pay out the top 10 players for each given day. Plus, we have one weekly 200 PLO leaderboard that will pay out the top five players of the week. For full details, head on over to once.run slash daily lead. And, as always, if you're looking to improve your poker game, be sure to check out Run It Once Training, where membership gives you access to the largest library of high-quality poker training content on the web with over 5,000 videos from a stable of some of the biggest names in the industry, including Run It Once founder, Phil Gelfond. Sign up now through once.run slash learn, and you'll get free access to three of their elite level videos. And now, let's get back to the pod. The major stuff going on right now, in the last week anyway on Twitter, was the Dean Eggs and, and Doug Polk uh, epic throwdown that's supposed to be happening at some point. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Are you over it? Are you interested in this? And whose side do you uh, favor here? Uh, I am not, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not over it and I'm not interested in it. Uh, I certainly don't <laughs> want to do anything but play poker. Uh, I was talking about this the other day with uh, David Tuckman, who had a great idea that when, when this does finish and he has great interest in it, he just wants it to be done. Have their, have their, whatever, whatever format they're doing, it's over. We're done. You know, it doesn't have to be Hamilton Burr where one person is dead and the other person goes on to do more work, but just have it done. Uh, it's, it's two people, you know, in the case that we've just talked about, Daniel. Uh, and so we know what Daniel's problems are. And Doug, who I get along with great, I probably get along with him better than I get along with Daniel. I do get along with both of them. You know, Doug is semi-retired. I thought he was retired from poker. But apparently he's semi-retired from poker, and the, the only part that he's not retired from is trolling Daniel. And he <laughs> does it better than anybody in the history of this nation, uh, if not the history of the Western world. Uh, you know, my hat's off to him for him being able to just find the right things and just keep coming at them. So I just, I, and, and even though, again, the Daniel supporters said that that video that was put together, uh, that, Dan, that Doug showed by Thomas, was like the worst thing in the history of the world. It was brilliant. Okay, now you can, again, where do you draw the line? Daniel's allowed to feed teeth anally and call somebody sea suckers and all that, but Doug can't put together an edited video making Daniel look like he's going to look like. So I wish it was over. Uh, Doug's very creative with it. Uh, I don't care what format they play in. Uh, I just hope they do it, and I hope that we are done with it. Yeah, what if, like, I don't know, I want to know how Marley thinks about this idea, but I was thinking if they impose not just the financial um, stakes, but to say whoever wins 
gets to, or how about whoever loses takes a three month break from Twitter and everyone gets wow. to just breathe. Well, Doug doesn't need to, but Daniel's like an ambassador now and he's got to, you know, keep up face. So that would be a huge hit to Daniel for sure. I feel no, like, I like, yeah. No, Doug- I like that uh, idea. I don't, you know, that reminds me that the other problem I have with Daniel is I've, I've told him many, many times is he's never wrong. Even when his position changes, well, it's it's the old thing a uh, boxing promoter used to said. What I told you, what I was telling you yesterday was a lie. What I'm telling you today is the truth. Daniel will take a position and he is just all in on it, and then he goes on to Twitter and talks about it. You know, whether it's a choice center, whether it's veganism, whether it's the mask, whatever. But he'll change his position from time to time, and all, it's often to suit his own needs. He had a break from Twitter a while ago. It was a couple of years ago, and he decided, boy. Twitter is just, you know, it's just when I was away from Twitter, I was a better person, which I'm sure he was. We all are. So he decided, all right, for now on, I forget the exact time frame of it. But each and every day, I am not going to be on Twitter more than 15 minutes. And I'm not preaching this. I'm just going to say this is going to going to make me happy. Okay. The 15 minutes thing that made him happier on Twitter lasted for about 15 minutes. He was back full, you know, full bore on Twitter. So you can keep him off for three months if they make that agreement. But that'll just have him double up on how much time he's on it later on. <laughs> I I agree with that, though. I, I applaud his effort to stay off Twitter because I think some people don't even self-assess. Like, some people just go, like, blah, 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 every day, whatever. And, like, for me, I'm like, I know it makes me miserable. <laughs> I have sat down and assessed my life and been like, man, Twitter makes me pretty sad. I get in beefs I don't need to be in. Like, I'm a poker player. I could be totally individualist and not talk to anyone and just play poker, and that's how I make money and have friends outside of poker. But no. I'm on Twitter reading about every beef, interviewing Norman Chad about Doug Polk and Daniel Negreanu <laughs> having a Twitter battle. Um, and I realized that the other day, because right after we got our puppies, I was sitting at home maybe three or four days into it. And I was like, oh my God, I should check Twitter. And I had like DMs from people. And I had mentioned that I had all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this doesn't matter at all. Like besides the DMs, or it's like maybe they want to talk to you about something, you really don't need it. I didn't need it. And the happiest I was with this new puppy the less I was on Twitter and I'm like, oh shit. Right. <laughs> By the way, I almost left. So I was researching and you're not going to like the reason why I did not leave Twitter, Jamie, when I tell this story, Uh-oh. but I was researching a few months ago, how to, what's the best way to leave Twitter without leaving Twitter. And I, I, I saw that cause I didn't want to lose necessarily if I wanted to come back to Twitter, I didn't want to lose all my, whatever stored mm-hmm. and like my followers, the following. So you can, I looked at it. Obviously if you want to leave Twitter, you can just delete your account. And then when you come back, everything's gone and you have to have a new, you can't, you have to have a new screen name if it's within one year, I believe. But mm-hmm. you can, you can suspend yourself from Twitter for up to 30 days without losing anything. So I thought I, what I would do is I would simply suspend myself from Twitter for four weeks at a time, 28 or 29 days. Then once a month, I'd go on and see what the DMs were, anything mm-hmm. I need to update myself on and then leave it again and just not go on to it 28 or not 29 days because it was, it was really making me worse. I suffered from depression to begin with. I think Twitter is just a really bad place to occupy yourself and there's no positive anything in the long run or the short run with Twitter. So I nearly left it. And the only reason I didn't leave it is I decided to start this, uh, it was a dance, I'll talk to Marley. I started a dance called the Uka Luka uh, to make myself feel better, uh, to be more positive on Twitter and to eventually, it's gonna start this month to do a charitable element to it. Lean to the left, lean to the right. Glance at the heavens and dance all night. It's time to ooga It's time to ooga Slide to the left, slide to the right. Glance at the heavens and dance all night. It's time to ooga It's time to ooga it's time to ooga luka. It's time to ooga luka. So the ooga luka kept me on Twitter. I lost a few friends. Uh, Jamie was one of them. So we're just acquaintances now. Some of my closest friends cannot stand to look at it. They talk about it in dark spaces, so I can't hear about it. But the only reason I did not leave Twitter was to do a daily ooga luka over the last three months. Is it just to, to raise the, the general morale on Twitter and give people something positive to look at or? 
Yeah, it, it, there's a combination. I actually had written a longer song, which I, I don't do on Twitter because the, the words aren't that good. But I, I envisioned it as a modern day or a latter day version of We Are the World, which was back before you were all were born. But you all, you know, so We Are the World ended up being like children from all around the world holding hands in a, in a positive message that, you know, we can all be together, that there, there aren't any differences, there are no borders. So the ukuluka was actually designed in my mind for have kids. And part of the later part of the uh, the song is where they they incorporate their own hi I'm you know I'm 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 blah blah from Afghanistan hi I'm blah blah from Brazil and they all stand it so yeah I wanted to have fun I wanted to be more positive and I wanted to send this message out uh, in general about that we even for all the differences we have we actually have more in common than we think and we should cling on to the the similarities rather than trying to to exacerbate the differences. Because we just hate, you know, I always say we hate other people, not to get serious for a second. We hate out of people out of ignorance. We hate them because they have a different language. They have a different cuisine. They have a different culture. They have a different way of life. And then if you just spend time with them, you'll see that, we're, you know, they're just trying to get to the next day. You know, they want a roof over their heads. <laughs> they want food on their table. They want their loved ones safe. And they hope that tomorrow is better. That's it. And, uh, you know, it's one of my old things that if you were raised, if I was taken out of the, you know, taken out of the crib at, at a month old, and, and shipped to Bulgaria and brought up with a Bulgarian family, would I think bad things about Bulgarians? No, that's my way of life. You know? And so if a Bulgarian kid was sent to, sent to America and sent to Paramus, New Jersey, oh, why would they want to be sent to Paramus, New Jersey? I guess you want to be near the mall. But and you grew up as American, you wouldn't think all Americans are ugly or something. You grew up in an American way of life. That's just the way it works. So if we just all did this together, we would, we, we'd be in a lot better shape. Yeah, Do you feel so good about the Luca hate right now, huh? huh? Yeah, I got something Are to say. Tart? Of course, I have something to say. Good about the Luca hate, you tart. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say about the charitable aspect that you're going to start. Um, are you going to accept donations uh, from people who just want you to stop? <laughs> <laughs> See, this, Martin, this is what they think. Uh, okay, in in the, the old famous Bambi meets Godzilla, the sixty second video that was done like three thirty years ago, where it's Bambi and Godzilla, and uh, you know. People keep thinking Jamie's Bambi and I'm Godzilla. That's the hilarious thing. I'm the big bad wolf who's just going to stomp her out. And you know what she is? And now she has a puppy and she knows this with the puppy she has. She's the puppy who's always gnawing away. And you're just trying to take, you know, you're kicking your foot away. Get away, get away, get away, get away. You're not even looking at them. And then you look down and your entire pants leg has been torn off by this little puppy. That's who she is. She is Princess Buttercup, a.k.a. Edible <laughs> Lecter. <laughs> yes, I'll be Thank taking you. donations from people who want me to stop. Thank you. If I'm ever, uh, if I ever make like a highlight reel, that's going to be in it. That's going to be like, if I'm trying to get a role as the ambassador or something, that that's my pitch. <laughs> well, the wonderful Jesse, <laughs> uh, Jesse Fullen, uh, one of uh, Jason Somerville's run it, run it up, run it, whatever mm -hmm. the people who now works for Poker News, he has taken it upon himself. And he actually did a highlight rule to Ukaluka already, but he did a remix. But he's taken upon himself to uh, to be my charity force, and he's putting together a package to where it'll almost be like the ice bucket challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. He explained to me where we have two pros yes. who have to do it, and yeah, we'll we'll be starting that hopefully by the end of this month. And you, yeah, I told you I would participate if our dogs reunited. We would do a, a blue and buttercup Ukaluka. Yes, so we will do that because they will re reunite at least once a year. Yeah, I have to. Let me text. Carry on amongst yourselves. I'm going to text Chris and see if I can get a puppy delivered up here. Um, before puppy comes up, I wanted to ask you, so you came up with the Norman Chad School of Poker a long time ago. How do you feel about there being so many new training sites out there? I'm trying to rip off your idea. <laughs> Actually, I came up with it almost when there were training sites that were started. And so okay. it was sort of like the anecdote to them. And obviously, I'm not an analyst, an, an analytical guy, a strategic guy. So I, mm -hmm. I started as an expression you know, that, that this person would be a professor of the Norman Chad School of Poker, actually, because they're so bad, uh, stuff like that. They're, they're a donkey, or they do donk bets. They would be, they would be tenured at the Norman Chad School of Poker. <laughs> I love the expression. And then a friend of mine at poker, uh, who just finished second in a bracelet event the other night in PLO, uh, Matt Vengren, who lives in Las Vegas, he actually wants to try to make it a real thing, where the Norman Chad School of Poker actually does with, deals with everything, Marley, other than GTO, and strategy. We deal with poker etiquette. We deal with, we deal with poker management. We deal with personal lives. You know, you should never date another poker player, for instance, for starters, uh, stuff like that. So he actually wants to try to find a way to have people go to an online Norman Chad school of poker. I told him, good luck. I'm with you. 
<laughs> I don't think that that's going to be a thing. I like that idea. That's class. I have a visitor. If you uh, if you want them to have a meeting. Oh look. Oh look. I was confused. Oh, I thought you had gone to Toronto. <laughs> that's later today. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So I still I had to do a, I've been doing recap a weekly ninety second uh, essay for the Poker Go recap that Ali mm-hmm. and Maria. And I just taped one last night where I was making fun of uh, Marley. I was making fun of all the poker broadcasters who are really good poker players and what type of World Series they had uh, compared to people who are not really good poker players <laughs> and not being regarded as broadcaster anymore. And Jamie was one of the four, and I did mention that she had fled to Toronto. So you are fleeing to Toronto, correct? No. <laughs> no, I'm not playing. I was making fun of the people who are pretending to uh, go places when they're really VPNing. So yeah, oh, I posted that was a picture well of you. What? No, you did it. I saw your tweet. Yeah, you had a tweet where you were. Oh, look, I ran into somebody on a flight to Toronto. I didn't even know he so could him. fly to Toronto. Okay, so you yeah, got me. Yeah, yeah. So I took a picture from Pinterest of the pyramids in Egypt, um, and said I'm on my way to Toronto. <laughs> That's pretty good. Well, I yeah. have you going to Toronto in whatever that recap is. That's uh, great. Whatever it airs this week. Uh, thankfully, we got this one. Oh, they're babies. And they're so similar, actually. And uh, what I want to do when we get a chance, Jamie, is I'm going to send you a, because you know how to do this technologically. I'll just send you a photo, like the one you sent me uh, when she was on your bed or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just send you a photo of her sitting, and then you take a photo of her in the exact same position, and can't you just put them side by side somehow onto yeah. an a tweet? Yeah. Yeah, your your puppy though gained so much more weight. Uh, she was having issues, stomach issues, the first three days, and was throwing up all the food. And I was like oh. freaking out. We called the vet, and they were like, "If she's not okay in a day or two, and then now she's fine, and she's gained like four pounds in a week. But wow. before that, I just kept looking at your videos, and I was like, "Wow, Blue is getting so like healthy looking. Like she's definitely thicker. And this one's like lanky. She's okay. getting cool. long. She'll instead. catch up though. Yeah." Yeah. You're so well behaved. Oh yeah, please. That's for the cameras. That's see. Uh, yeah, I love. It. Yeah, as soon as I, I see love, that. <laughs> you know, I do love in bed. And my again, Tony, my wife told me the one she gave me like ten instructions before she came back here. And number one or number two is do not let them sleep in the bed with you. And I broke that on day two. So it's what impossible. I do love is that when she's ready to get up in the morning at seven in the morning, like she's just doing right now, she climbs onto me and starts licking the chin or chewing the left ear. Uh, so they have that in common. So uh, it's a great way to wake up in the morning. Yeah, the whole like they're so sweet and innocent. That is fake news. That's one thing I can say. She sounds like a gremlin, Marley. If you look at my Instagram, um, I'm at Jamie Likes Dogs. I have videos of her where she acts like a total gremlin. She's like sprinting around screaming, um, and then ten minutes later, fast asleep like an angel. Good puppies. Maniacs. Yeah, Norm. T- talk about sleep. adopting the puppy. Tell tell the whole story because it's great. Well, uh, I'll tell it as brief as I can and without any emotion, but it, you know, I, I, we, we've, we've been adopting rescues for several years and my stepdaughter has volunteered in a, a rescue here in Los Angeles right near us. So we, so, uh, our third rescue, uh, Daisy passed away in April. Uh, and it was very upsetting. She, she wasn't old enough to pass away. She had a, a bad break with some surgery and, uh, she was gone several days after the surgery and I was just heartbroken. My wife wasn't here and it's, and I just get tired of dealing with, the, this, just the breaking of the heart of these these creatures that become part of your lives. So I was pretty much done. Again, I didn't know. I was waiting for Tony, my wife, to come back to get another dog, uh, and because she's always gotten the dogs, I never picked them out. And then Jamie, I don't even think she thought I was going to take her up on it. She happened since Jamie was looking for her own rescue puppy mix. And in fact, I loved the fact that the first time she was going to get one, somebody had a litter, and I believe you, I think it was seven seven puppies in the litter, and you wanted a female, and they were all male. Yeah. Seven so it's like losing flips. seven coin flips. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the best thing I've ever heard in my life. By the way, I had to explain that to Tony 53 times to make her appreciate <laughs> what that means. Uh, I, should have, I should have quit after the first time because Tony's not a poker player. But Tony, so, so we get a break where she, I get a break where she lo- loses seven coin flips, which is good. I'm glad she lost seven coin flips because that led her to wherever she had found another place. Mm-hmm. And, and she sent me a video, Jamie sent me a video of, of uh, a soon to be named Buttercup. And with one of her sisters, and she says, yeah, I know this is a long shot. You're probably not ready, but here are these two puppies. I'm taking one of them. If you want the other one, you, you, know, you can come here and, and get them. And I, you know, it was like a fluke. And we actually got Daisy uh, on a fluke. 
So I said, I might as well go do it. I might, well, it's just stupid for me to sit here in misery. My therapist has told me to go get a dog. My wife's told me to get a dog. Anybody who comes in contact with me says, you got to get another dog. So I ended up driving to Las Vegas on a Thursday. And then Friday, I picked her up in North Las Vegas uh, and drove her home. Aww. And uh, that's what, just a couple yeah. of weeks ago. I, I told Marley about this. I don't think I, I told you exactly the extent of it. It was really funny. Uh, so talking to the foster, after I had hyped you up about this dog and you're like, yeah, I want this dog. I was like, okay. I talked to the the shelter and they were being weird about certain things. They're like, okay, we need you to come here at this time, this appointment. I show up. The appointment's the next day. They gave me the wrong day. I was like, oh my God. I was like, if this falls through, I'm going to die. And then they mentioned there, I was just like, well, my friend's uh, adoption is still set up, right? They're like, okay, well, he'll have to email. And they're making it sound not done. And I was like, what is this? So finally, um, the foster person says, yeah, they don't really like out-of-state adoptions. And I was like, you're telling me this now? So I actually hyped you up so much, Norm. I was like, he is so famous. He's like a Kardashian in the poker world. I was like, <laughs> Norm will sell this puppy. Like the foundation will be blasted all over everywhere. I'm like, you would just be, you guys would be fools not to, <laughs> to let him adopt. And the foster is like, oh yeah, like I'll just let them know. And she emails them and they're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you're a you Norm Kardashian. Me, when you told me it might fall through, I, I would have been upset, but not as upset as you were if yours fell through because you had actually met Buttercup. Yeah. And uh, I would have been disappointed. And then you told me you're going to go that route. I go, is that really going to work? That I'm a famous person? I actually, I have plugged them. I've plugged them on the Ookaloogas. I've yep. plugged them on Twitter. And uh, I will, and I always plug rescue dogs anyway, anytime I talk to anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, when I've done charity events over the years and I'm walking around from table to table and I talk about dogs, they say, you know, it's always, I should, I should have done this with women years ago. They go, you know, we always thought you were a complete asshole, but <laughs> if the way you talk about rescue dogs, you can't be a complete asshole. So uh, it actually is good for your image, I think, <laughs> and that is my, my purpose, but it's good for your image to talk about rescues. I'm, I'm next. I really need to get one, but we're so kind of not stable right now in the UK. I'm in the UK, but I have, we have cats, so. But you did a good thing. She rescued a cat that had in front of the cage, there was the picture of a face, like an emoji. And it's the one with a straight line. That's just like this. And they said, it's a grumpy cat. It's a full grown grumpy like, ass cat. And she took him anyway. <laughs> well, we wanted it. We walked up cause, and they were like, they had like five, they have two kittens and ours, the one we got, his name is Olaf. He's six. And he looks so grumpy in his photo too. And we were like, who is that? And they were like, you don't want him. <laughs> they were just like, you do not want him, whatever. And we were just like, the more they said no, the more we, we had to have him. And so uh, when we met him, he, then we went to go get pick him up. He bit Spraggy and uh, we, knew it was, we knew it was meant to be after that. And he's warmed up a lot. He's warmed up a lot. He's definitely not a lap, a lap cat, but he's very affectionate. And, you know, he's warmed up. <laughs> Poor baby. He's just temperamental. He was in a house with five kids and I think they just terrorized him. And now he's just, it's so funny. Like they are so much like humans. Like I feel like the first few years of their lives really like defines their personality kind of, you know, if they're in like a stable environment, they're just calm their whole life. But mm -hmm. if they get traumatized early, they kind of always have that edge. I don't know. It's, For sure. It's, I had a dog, a rescue dog that I got when he was a year and a half old and he was starving on a highway and he never lost for 15 years we had him he was always so protective of food we overfed him we fed him in his own little spot no one if a, if one of the cats walked by while he was eating he'd be like snarl and like kind of bite at them and i'm like it never went away i was like once you have that imprinted at such a young age that like you're gonna have to fend for yourself and and make sure like you always have food like that's why I'm, these are the first puppies I've ever had crouton and buttercup. I never had a puppy who always got older dogs. And it's just crazy. It seems like, wow, I know everything that's happened to you. <laughs> like their whole history has happened in this house and they don't have any like issues or anything. It's like kind of refreshing, but at some point I want to get a pit bull rescue and we're going to have like a retirement home side of it where we just take all the old dogs from the shelters and let them just like chill on a ranch. Yeah. It should be fun. That's a, the, the weird thing, again, uh, which I've mentioned quite, quite often, a disproportionate amount of the rescues, certainly in California, are pit mixes. Mm -hmm. And they're older dogs because no one wants older dogs. And actually, that's yep. been part of the problem that we've had. We keep getting older dogs. And it's hard to, you know, it's hard emotionally to keep 
going through older dogs are only with you for three, four, five years. Uh, but yeah, the, there's a definitely a pecking order in the rescue shelters. Thank God they're no longer, you know, they're now no kill shelters, but mm -hmm. nobody wants the older dogs. No one wants a problem dog or a pit. And so we've always been drawn to, you know, who else is going to take them. And, uh, I, I'm sure we were going to get an older pit again this time before, uh, Buttercup and Blue came around. And so it's probably a blessing in disguise again that you contacted me. It's not even in disguise because now we've got a puppy for the first time who yeah. may not make it. You may be going to the pound. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it's it's nice that you can, like there's a good chance you'll have her for a long time. And that for me anyway, like I was happy with just Crouton, but I'm also like so emotionally invested that I can't have it like that. Like I was like, I can't have a five-year-old dog and I'm so emotionally invested. If anything happens to him, I'll go crazy. And I know that. So I was like, we wanted to adopt an older dog. But then I'm like, wait a second. Now I'm just like hastening the sadness. So I'm like, we'll just stagger them. And like, now that we have these two, um, I'm not sure when the next time I'll get another dog is, but we'll get an older one. Because I feel like it kind of is cheating when you're like, oh, I adopted this dog. I rescued this dog. I'm like, everyone would rescue this dog. Mm -hmm. She's so cute. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good story though. That you're just like you like picked out Spraggy too. You have a thing for like the grumpy castaways. <laughs> oh, Spraggy is now a, a grumpy castaway, huh? That's a good one. I gotta meet Spraggy. I like him. He's British. You would love Spraggy. You don't know Spraggy? Oh my god, you guys are like. I just know him wow. from offline. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you'd be best friends for sure. everything. It's so funny. Like the the attitude over here is like everyone's Spraggy. Like he's just like. Huh? Why don't you go to therapy? Just talk about it. Just hey, just figure, just just forget about it. Just, just don't worry about it. Like everything is so chill and just whatever, you know, laid back. I like it. Um, what else do you want to end on? A ha we ended on the happiest note with the puppies, but is yeah. there anything coming up you want to talk about, or like, what's your life like when now? Like, there's no WSOP. What What do you do the rest of the year? I assume you just kind of like live in a cave and come out for one week a year. That that's true? Yeah, so actually for th whatever 35 years i've been writing a once a week sports column which i just actually indirectly because of the clay travis thing uh i just quit that column uh in june uh mm -hmm. and i don't know if i'm going to resume it and that's pretty sad too I, I literally have had a relationship with the washington post since i was in college uh, i've been writing columns since, since 1985 i didn't realize how many years have gone by since 1985 so uh the Clay Travis also triggered the end of a 35-year column career for me. Uh, so I don't know what I'm going to do writing-wise. Uh, I am trying to do – I'm trying to get into the gambling sector when, again, COVID has stopped a lot of stuff in, in, all, in all industries and including the TV and entertainment industry. So the gambling sector, which is going to grow, uh, I have a lot of history in gambling. So, again, I would do gambling the same way I do poker, which is sort of an anti – you know, I'm not doing the, uh, all the analytical stuff uh, that gam most, most losing gamblers do. And even the guys now who are running all the numbers are still only right half the time. Very few people beat gambling. So I'd love to do gambling content uh, online or on TV, which again is, is more like, it's just like sports talk radio over the years kind of morphed into more like, for lack of a better term, man radio, where you're just not talking about sports, you're talking about what's going on in the culture. And then bad sports TV radio is really sexist and misogynist and all this, where they're just making jokes about women and, and objectifying women, all that, but done well, it's, it's where you, you sports is just a launching pad. And then you talk about whatever's going on in the news. You'll, you'll, you know, you talk about trends, you'll talk about politics, you'll talk about wall street. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to do a gambling thing, which is humorously done where we still make picks, but we're talking about the world around us and we're doing the exact opposite of everybody else who's running the numbers, the GTO version of gambling. And that's what I'd like to do if I could find an opening there. And continue to do poker, maybe. Poker's even moving more, unfortunately. We, we didn't get into this as much. But, you know, poker is moving more uh, into uh, the analytic part of it and the GTO part of it mm -hmm. on, on all levels. Uh, Twitch streamers go the other way sometimes when they're entertaining. But as far as the, the stuff that, that Poker Go does and all that, they're looking for more of stuff that isn't me. So I find that unfortunate. I think, you know, I think I know there's been some sort of uh, – Rush back now that, oh, we need to return to the great days and when we told stories and we had characters and all that. Uh, that's hard work. That takes money. That takes effort. And that takes the intention to do that. And I don't see that out there. So uh, I might be stepping away from poker before I step more into it because I really think it's going a different direction. That's too bad. I, I, think, I feel like we need more the opposite, more character, more life, more juice in the common commentary. But uh yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah, I think so too, only because I like listening to GTO stuff too. I want to improve, but there's a difference. Like you can watch run at once training if you yeah. want to learn stuff. And then when I want to kind of veg out, watch poker and like hang out, I don't want to, I'm not there trying to like learn. I want to be entertained. I want to hear people's stories. I want to hear about if that's the guy's like first six figure score or whatever. I like the interviews. I feel like you don't have to be studying all the time. I don't want it to be a drag where you're like sitting down to a stream and like, all right, I'm gonna be really bored. Let's see if I can get through one hour of the stream. Yeah. No, actually, I think we learned a story actually from Dario this summer, who finished second at the main event. I, I, I do put a connection, I think we talked about it a little, that he stepped away from the, the grind and studying it as much, and he feels refreshed now when he plays. Mm -hmm. His mind's clearer, and I think his results are better. So I, I do think there's something to, you know, going out and smelling the roses and not studying all the time. And then certainly from an entertainment standpoint on poker television, I do think if you want to bring more people under the tent, as they had from day one of the poker boom with Moneymaker, you bring it more under the tent by not talking strategy. You're just talking people and stories and characters and confrontations at the table. I've said this a million times. People, you know, they don't, there's hardly any hands you remember. There's, you know, here and there, aces versus aces. But what you remember is, you know, Mike the Mouth and Sheiky going against each other, Phil Helmuth and Sam Grizzle, Prolod Freeman and Jeff Lissandro. Just these are the moments that you want to see again and again and again. Not, the, oh, look, he sucked out on the turn of the river. Mm -hmm. Ooh, honey, honey, come over here. You got to see this river card. No, 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 forget the castle egg. Come over here. No, they, they want to see people talking with each other and unusual people. And that's the, wish, the way I wish we would return to. And even though there's a lot of lip service towards it, I just don't see it happening. Mm, that's too bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to take a, a second away because the, the little shit decided that the ant trap looked tasty. She's been in here for one minute. <laughs> I, was oh like, what? I don't want to kill this poor dog. She's like 12 pounds, so anything she eats is just, I don't know. Oh, by the way, it's speaking scary. of that, uh, to, to end on a good and bad note, on the same mm -hmm. thing. So uh, about a week or so ago, uh, she was under the coffee table and, you know, I just looked under the coffee table. I wasn't even looking at her and she had completely chewed up my Apple power cord. I mean, just, and I was told I was fortunate because I was plugged in. She could have electrocuted herself. So, uh, you know, we you know, ordered one from Best Buy, got one the next day. They're not, both those things are expensive now, by the way, like 75 or $80. Yeah. The night before I'm going to prim for my 13th place finish at 11.55, I was leaving for prim at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, she comes bounding in here from outside. Uh, she, she just reaches for the cord, which, I'm, you know, she's never done anything when she, it's right in front of me. She reaches for the new cord I just purchased three minutes ago. She makes one little indentation with one little puppy tooth, cord gone again. She's no. destroyed her second cord in five days. And this time, first of all, I got 8% left on my computer. I'm leaving in the morning to go play online. And Best Buy doesn't open till 10. So thankfully, my wife, who does a really good job in this, she checked Target. We have a Target. A, the Target a mile and a half from me had cords open. They opened at 8 in the morning. Because of her, I had to get up extra early, go to Target at 8 o'clock in the morning, spent another $75 on another cord, and made my way to Prim, and I finished 13th. So she was not sent. Norm, you, you forgot to do the thing, though, where you yell really loud and scare and go, I don't mean you, baby, not you. <laughs> That's very, that's very good. That's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, anyway, so yes, that all's well that ends well, but she destroyed two cords in five days, cost me $155, and she's still with me. They're definitely related. <laughs> They're definitely from the same litter. Dude, she's a little troll. I love her so much, but yeah, she's going to cost infinite money in cord chewing as well. Yeah. But anyway, this has been really fun. Um, Aww, blue. Oh, I knew we were getting off the air, so she wanted one more uh, camp meal. What is the significance of blue? Uh, it's Just weird. We we had a previous dog that I wanted to name blue. I, I I've never named any of our dogs. Uh, I was actually waiting for Jamie to name Buttercup because I was going to pay homage to Jamie and Buttercup by coming up with a complimentary name for this dog. Uh their household could not figure out a name for three or four days. I don't work that way. Uh, I like the name Blue, actually, for some reason. And then she's got brown eyes, but I'm calling her Blue. Uh, and if I'd waited for Jamie to name it Buttercup from one of my favorite films as well, that would have been a problem for me because there's not a lot of other well-known names in that film. So, again, as I told Jamie, I would have had to name her Bazzini uh, or uh, 
uh, Fez. Inigo Montoya. <laughs> yeah, Inigo Montoya. <laughs> None of those names work. Uh, so, uh, so I just named her blue. I don't know. I, and blue, blue also, by the way, I wasn't sure I was going to name her blue. Uh, and, uh, when I picked her up in North Las Vegas, I had to go get gas first thing. I still didn't know what her name was going to be. I wasn't going to name her for two or three days. And when I got out of the car to, to pump the gas, the building next to me said in huge letters, blue granite was the name of the company. Oh. I said, ah, okay, if Jamie doesn't come up with a name, we're going to go with blue. So, oh. we went with, so we went with blue. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, this is so cute. I wish they could see each other. She doesn't really understand screens. Um, you know, she yeah. does, by the way. She's the first, you know, when she's, the large screen is on and uh, something, she hears a, something like a, a like a, 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 like a gunshot or mm -hmm. a dog bark. She, she looks up and she just stares at it for the next 30 seconds. The TV. Which shocks me. So oh, I, wow. I was going to take a video of her. I was watching a baseball game yesterday and she was on the edge of the bed. And the baseball game was boring. She was on the edge of the bed sitting up watching this game in the second inning and that's a bad sign that's a pretty dumb dog he just wants to see where the ball is going probably i guess so so uh, <laughs> yeah we'll get them together and we'll get a photo of them those side by side first okay sounds good all right, all right. it was nice talking to you norm yeah all right good all right. luck with uh, spraggy the two-legger and spraggy the four-legger <laughs> all right bye. bye have a good day you too